I think we'll get started now. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Mariah Mitchell Association Science Speaker Series. Um, I'm Samantha Dell, and I'm the Administrative Assistant here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, thank you for tuning in tonight. I'd first like to thank our sponsors for our Science Speaker Series, which are Bank of America, Cape Air, The White Elephant, and Cisco Brewers. As far as logistics tonight for tonight's event, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk using the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will hold all the questions till the end and then we'll get to those after the talk. Tonight's Science Speaker Series lecture is actually part of our second annual Nantucket Green Crab Week. We have a few more events coming up in the next couple of days. Tomorrow there is a info session and cooking demonstration available on Zoom. And Friday is our first ever Green Crab Derby, which we are super excited about. Um, for more information about those programs and to register, you can visit our website under the events tab. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jason Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is the Director of Research at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. His research focuses on crustacean ecology and fisheries and the effects of climate change on reproduction, physiology, and movement ecology. Dr. Goldstein currently holds research and teaching affiliations at the University of New Hampshire School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering, the University of New England, and York County Community College in Maine. So thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. I'm gonna shop, stop sharing my screen, sorry, tripping over my words there, and I am gonna pass it over to our speaker. Thank you, Sam. Um, let me share my screen here and say that I'm super excited to um, be able to speak to you on uh, Green Crab Week. I think this is like, could be the next, could displace Shark Week on the Discovery Channel. So I'm super excited about this. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Sam. And I also wanted to thank Jack uh, for the invitation to speak. Of course, I'd much rather be there in person. I've never been to Nantucket. Um, although I think Jack said he might arrange a Cape Air flight for me from Portland. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I'd love to be able to get over there at some point. Um, when I'm able to and when things are a little bit easier logistically. So um, I'm happy to take some questions along the way because I have a lot to say about green crabs. Uh, although truth be told, I am a uh, lobster biologist. So um, you'll see plenty of lobster references in this talk because in Maine, we can't really get away from talking about lobster. Um, it's virtually impossible. Uh, <clears throat> however, the subject that I wanted to talk to you tonight is applicable to your green crab week. And that is what we're doing with green crabs in Maine, um, specifically in Southern Maine and along um, the coast and at our research reserve. So I wanted to just also thank um, uh, my funding sources as well as uh, my collaborators uh, at those, um, the logos you see down there. And we have funding for a lot of our green crab project through uh, NOAA, through NOAA fisheries programs. So um, we'll get into all this, but um, the, the, the bottom line is we want all you awesome people to come to Maine on vacation, but we really don't want green crabs here. And um, we're looking for ways to either get rid of them or we're looking at ways to use them for other things. Um, it sounds like you're having a, um, a culinary dem demo tomorrow. So, um, there's some really good green crab recipes out there. So um, before I get into the talk, I, I thought it would be nice just to give you some context for uh, where I work and, and the marshes and the estuaries we manage. That's the, a picture of um, the Wells Reserve. That's one of our estuaries. That's the Little River uh, Estuary in Wells, Maine. And you can see right up the coast there to Walker Point uh, where the bush compound is. And um, around the bend would be um, Casco Bay. So we have a beautiful spot. You're all welcome to come visit. Uh, we're open every day, um, sunrise to sunset. There's another view. Um, that's our little river system in the foreground. And in the background is um, our Webb Hannett River estuary system, which is a very different uh, estuarine system. Um, both 
are, are very dynamic and are very unique in Maine because Maine doesn't have a lot of sandy estuaries. Those are mostly confined to uh, southern New England. Uh, we've got mostly rocky coastline. So this provides a really nice spot for us to do our research. Um, you can see off to the right there is our campus. That's our um, reserve campus where we have education, um, stewardship, and, and research programs. So just again, just to orient you to our system, um, we are a national system. Uh, we're partnered with NOAA, uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and we are the only reserve in, May, in Maine. There's four uh, reserves in New England, and there's 29 in total. And research, education, stewardship, training, and having fun are all you know, part of what we do. Um, there's 29 reserves that cover 24 states. Um, there are 75% of estuaries, as most of you probably already know, are home to 75% um, of all the fish and shellfish harvested in the US. Um, so some pretty interesting stats there um, in terms of how many people live near estuaries, um, most of the world's largest cities, uh, and uh, we log a lot of data. We monitor and log and are subjected to a lot of scrutiny with our data. And that's a good thing because that means that we can use our data um, for all kinds of analyses and we can say some really interesting things about short-term variability and long-term change throughout our nation's estuaries. And that's really why we exist, to, do, to basically go forward with those monitoring missions. And so along those lines, um, we study water quality, we study, um, we do plankton toes on a regular basis. Uh, we look at larval fish, crabs, we do a lot of salt marsh monitoring. Um, we have long-term marsh, marshes that we're looking at vegetation change, uh, sea level rise, crabs. Um, we have a, a program called MIMIC where we're looking at total invasive species monitoring uh, along the main coast. And of course, a lot more green crab monitoring, which is what I'm going to talk to you tonight. Um, but I'll get into a little bit about blue crabs as well. So um, not that this is a coincidence, but the way that these project, all these monitoring projects we have, um, they all fit together. The common denominator for us is really crabs. They're really the indicator species for most of our other programs. So for example, um, warming water. Uh, has an effect on the presence of new crab species, range expansions, uh, invasive species presence, and all those impacts. Um, salt marshes are impacted by invasive, invasive crabs. Um, we're looking at plankton and we're specifically focusing on crustacean decapods. Uh, so th the common denominator here is crabs. And we're really interested in how crabs are impacting main uh, coastlines and main estuaries. So the other piece of context I wanted to give you is uh, the context having to do with climate change. And specifically in our neck of the woods, and I know in Nantucket, um, you've got warmer water, you've got more of a Gulf Stream influence. Um, you have some really cool tropical fish that show up there, um, super cool. Um, we are a lot colder, but um, that being said, we are still warming. The Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest bodies of warming bodies of water in the world. And you can see this trending, um, this trending plot here uh, from our main climate report in 2020 shows that um, temperature has increased by, you know, 0.059 degrees per year since 1960, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, it's huge. And from a physiological point of view, marine animals have a tough time acclimating to that. We also have sea level rise in our estuaries and along our coastlines. Um, this is just some sea level rise data from uh, some tide gauge data taken along the coast. Um, I would say dimes to dollars, you probably have a similar uh, pattern on Nantucket Island and in Southern New England for sure. And especially Rhode Island where things are, marshes are getting wetter and sinking more every year. The other thing that's changing in our system in the Gulf of Maine is um, pH. So you've probably heard of coastal and ocean acidification. Uh, in the Gulf of Maine, uh, a lot of our um, currents and in, uh, inputs of ocean water and fresh water 
come from the Labrador current, which is that red arrow. And you can see that that's, that water is becoming fresher. And as a result, uh, pH is, is decreasing. So the intrusion of that low pH water has implications on um, shellfish, which is one of our biggest crops in the Gulf of Maine. And that's sort of exemplified here. If you look at this um, complicated, but somewhat simple bar graph, stack bar graph, um, it, just look at the pink and the, the gray bars and you can see that lobster and scallops, the, the value of those over the years has increased, which is really good if you're a scallop or a lobster farmer, a lobster harvester, but uh, it's not so good if you're relying on biodiversity. So those other things are just getting compressed and squeezed. And um, it's, uh, it's important to note that over 70% of all the species caught in the Gulf of Maine are shellfish. And um, I imagine that's similar in Nantucket as well. I noticed you had um, uh, scallop, Nantucket scallops on your website, and that's probably um, part of a, a source of revenue for the island as well. So um, all these changes, all these um, factors, and this is not an exhaustive list, and this is not meant to be a doom and gloom kind of beginning to this talk. However, um, these are major factors that are impacting the uh, ability of invasive species to sort of explode or take hold in our system. And I, I know that that's probably the case in your area as well. And so um, historically speaking, you know, green crabs have been around for a very long time. In fact, I would argue that they're probably not an invasive species anymore. They're a naturalized species. You know, 200 plus years of, you know, inundating our coastlines at various times, as you can see in this, in this uh, map here. Uh, more recently in, in the Canadian Maritimes um, and less recently in places like New York, New Jersey and um, you know, coastal Massachusetts and into Maine as well. But we have a big problem with green crabs. We have such a big problem that uh, we decided to do our own study a few years ago and find out um, how green crabs are changing along the coast of Maine. Uh, so we chose four sites and in 2014 we went to each site and we fished a lot of green crab traps and we measured a lot of green crabs and counted a ton of them. We wanted to see if there was a difference by um, location along the, the mid coast of Maine and um, this is sort of what we came up with. Uh, this is one of my favorite graphs in the world because it's uh, it was made with crabs and uh, we don't feel badly at all that we use dead crabs for this. Um, you can see uh, Wells uh, has the highest number of green crabs uh, out of all the other sites we compared. And I, I'm not showing you all the locations there, but we measured and weighed and counted over uh, 15,000 green crabs in one summer. So it's a really big deal. And so that led us to, to under, try to understand why is Wells, why is our site in Epicenter? Um, and we kept poking around in the marsh and we found that um, not only are green crabs prolific everywhere, but they're also uh, burrowing in our marshes. So you, this marsh, I wish I had a before picture, but um, they are burrowing in the marsh, they're, they're digging out mud, they're, they're de destabilizing our, our mud banks that are already um, under pressure from sea level rise and um, hydrology. So um, that's a big problem. And so we think they're intensifying that. We even went as so far to do CAT scans. Uh, we did soil core, we did um, peat cores in our marsh for this project that, I was just, that I'm describing. And you can see that yellow circle, inside that yellow circle is a green crab. That's almost a meter down in the marsh. So uh, it's not a skeleton, it was an actual live green crab. So we were using Maine Medical Center as a um, conduit for doing these CT scans. Totally unique thing to do. And um, lo and behold, we were finding green crabs underground pretty far. Um, like Nantucket, um, green crabs have an impact on our clam population, our soft shell clam population. And uh, this is a study that's been done by Brian Beal at Humane Machias. He uses uh, mudflats in our estuary and he is um, 
essentially looking at the densities of soft shell crabs and the densities of green crabs by flats from different towns that have commercial shellfish or clam digging operations, including wells. And so we're, we're, we're definitely number one in that top graph in that first plot where you can see we have an average of um, almost eight uh, crabs per flat on one area and about 2.2 in another. Uh, no one really comes close to us except for right up the road in Scarborough. And then for re clam recruitment density, there's a correlation between green crabs and recruitment uh, density, probably a negative, re a negative relationship there. So we have some of the fewest clam recruits in our estuary, um, in our mudflats. And uh, Brian Beal has been doing these predator exclusion experiments for decades. Um, you've probably read, you could read some of his reports and papers, uh, but he uses those boxes that are pictured there to um, manipulate densities of clams, look at different sizes of seed clams and look at uh, predation by green crabs. So again, another impact uh, that green crabs are having. Another way to look at this, um, we used, uh, we did an analysis, uh, sort of a metadata analysis uh, this past year on um, the green crab abundance uh, from the southern part of um, southern Maine to the northern part of northern Maine, if that makes any sense. So basically from where we are, just south of us in Kittery, Maine, up to uh, Chibig Island, which is one of the Casco Bay Islands up by Portland. And if you just kind of scan across from left to right with your eyes, um, what I want you to notice is for each year over a, you know, approximately an eight year period or so, you can see um, the, the presence of those crabs getting stronger, of green crabs that is. And this is data that we've collected as part of our MIMIC program, the Marine Invader Monitoring and Information Collaborative. So this includes tide pools, docks, and cobble shorelines. This does not include estuaries, but um, what you do see is a gradient from south to north, you see that these growing numbers, this growing presence as we um, go through, as we increase, as we go through time and we monitor the same locations over that same uh, temporal window. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've mentioned some of this already, the impacts of, from green crabs, um, green crabs have this impact on marshes, they have an impact on native species, uh, like like um, soft shell clam. They also, we think, have an impact on lobster. Um, I've explored, um, we've explored some of that before, and uh, that's a, a little bit alarming. However, the one of the silver linings here is the ability to mitigate through the creation of a fishery, and that's uh, one of the things I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Is a new project that we started this year. Um, where we're looking at creating a green crab fishery uh, specifically for soft shell product. Uh, this is something that some others have done in Maine as well. Um, because if you go to Italy, if you go to Venice, you'll be able to find green crab on the menu um, and it's upwards of uh, almost $50 a plate. So it's a real delicacy there and they thrive on using soft shell green crab um, in order to maximize cost and then um, uh, they claim that it's a really good product. So that's something we're really interested in trying to work with fishermen and harvesters in our area to do that. So um, we did so we've been doing research on green crabs over the past few years. Um, we've published a few papers. Um, we've published papers on um, the impact of uh, green crabs in um, Great Bay Estuary, just to our south in New Hampshire. Uh, we have looked at um, the impact of, of green crabs in salt marshes, and we've been looking, and we also did a project with, some, from, with all the reserves in 2017 and 2018, where we looked at the impact of crabs in general uh, on salt marsh uh, stability. And uh, you can find these papers all um, probably on Google or some of them are open access, but if you if you want one, just let me know. So really, in order to understand green crabs or anything else for that matter, um, 
we need a monitor. And I know that um, many of you folks there at MMA, um, the Science Center there, this is exactly what you're engaged in. And that's really awesome because that's where you wanna be, especially now. You wanna be able to detect, you know, have a sentinel detection system so you can actually see when are things showing up in my area? Um, what are those impacts? How does that, how do we connect that to population dynamics and life history? And um, are there other types of, with respect to green crabs, are there ways to create opportunities that we can learn about them, but also capitalize on them as well? Okay, I'm a scientist. I am not an economist. I am not an entrepreneur by any means. But uh, one thing I've learned is if you can try to bring industry uh, folks into the picture, it, it could be a very fruitful uh, relationship. So, um, what do we do in our estuaries for green crabs? We, we trap, we do that um, regularly. We use these things called pitfall traps, uh, which are essentially tennis ball cans that we insert into the marsh, flush with the marsh surface um, along long-term transects we have. And then we come back 24 hours later and we count and measure um, crabs. So that's another, there's many types of methods monitoring uh, strategies to get at the questions you're interested in. We use quadrat sampling as well that you can see pictured. So uh, we, do, we do burrow counting, we do all kinds of things. Um, but but we, lately, the last couple of years, we've, we've tried to figure out what else can we do that would be really interesting and informative to uh, help us understand the impacts of probably the most um, significant marine invasive species in our area. Uh, so that's kind of what I want to do to explore the rest of the evening. But if there's a question or two, um, I'm happy to take that now, or I could keep going. So Sam, I'll let you decide um, if there's something you want somebody has. Oh, and this is grape juice, just, by the way. <laughs> no problem. Um, it doesn't look like there are any questions active in the Q&A at the moment. Um, so right. just another plug, if you have any questions, keep sending them throughout, um, especially uh, if you're gonna answer them throughout the talk, that would be awesome. But right now it doesn't look like there okay. are any questions. So you can- Awesome, keep I'll keep going. going. But if, yeah. I mean, I had a question, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, Absolutely. So back on the slide where you were showing us the almost like core sampling, um, did the crabs, are they able to live that far down in there? I mean, you said they weren't dead, they were alive. Um, yeah, it was a burrow. Um, you know, they create these tunnel systems. And it's really interesting because we don't really understand how extensive that is because it's very hard to tease apart natural um, marsh erosion, you know, rates of erosion, uh, and then rates of um, accretion. So sediment accretion in the marsh happens naturally. Um, ironically, it probably happens more because of sea level rise because you're bringing more water in. And so some people argue that you're actually depositing more sediment in the marsh. Um, that being said, we see crabs and burrows all the time. The question is, are they starting the burrows from scratch or are they using holes and crevices and things that are already existing? And that's actually an unanswered question. And I am not a hardcore marsh ecologist, but I think that would be a really cool thing to try to answer. So if anybody has, a, has heard of doing such a thing, um, I'd love to hear about it. And you can come to Wells and do a study. So, but that's a great question, Sam. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, I'll just assume everybody understands what I'm saying, which is good. That doesn't always, good. Yeah. Doesn't always <laughs> happen in my world. Okay. That's awesome. So let me talk about one new, one new project that we have. Um, it's actually not that new, but um, we, so we decided, okay, we can trap green crabs all day long. And that's what we do, um, but what about where they go? And uh, we thought about doing some tagging, you know, tag them and then put out a bunch of traps and say, oh, well, where do they end up? And we catch, we recapture tagged crabs. But essentially um, what we ended up doing was we started a pilot study 
a couple of years ago where we put uh, what we call acoustic telemetry tags on the backs of a bunch of a few green crabs, a few like six of them, because the tags are super expensive and uh, you have to have a system of receivers underwater that can listen for the crab and log the presence of that crab this, and a specific crab identification number um, when the crabs are in proximity to it. So we set out in a, a tele, what we call a telemetry array in 2018. We tagged six crabs. Um, uh, I worked with, uh, we did this with uh, Professor Nathan Fury from University of New Hampshire and his graduate student. And then one of my uh, Noah Holling scholars, uh, a uh, college senior, senior who did her internship at, at Wells Reserve working on this. And we found some really cool stuff. Um, this was super exciting. Um, nobody to our knowledge has put telemetry tags on green crabs that extensively or for that long. We had them in um, for months. And uh, there's a picture of our harbor. So um, we were covering that whole harbor with receivers. And this just a snippet of data from on the bottom there, the, the circle was the release point, uh, that like fixed circle. And then you can see for an ovigerous female or a, an egg bearing female, a non ovigerous female and a male, they had very different movement patterns. And so that's the really cool thing about uh, acoustic telemetry is you can get very fine scale data uh, about where these crabs go. You know, what types of habitats they use, how deep did they go, what temperatures did they prefer, where did they go in the summer? Where did they go in the fall? Um, this, is, this has been done extensively for like blue crabs and lobsters in other parts um, of New England and in um, other areas of the country, but nowhere that we know of has it been done this extensively. So we actually wrote up a paper on this um, and we're working on that right now, but um, that was really exciting to us. Um, it was so exciting that we're, we're doing another study that I'll, I'll tell you about that's very similar to this, but with just way more crabs. Okay. Um, the other thing that we, we've been experimenting with is this thing called eDNA. Um, and I'm sure that some of you have heard of eDNA, and I could probably give like a whole separate talk on this. Um, e, the E stands for environmental DNA. So it's the idea that at least in the marine realm, fish and crabs and lobsters and all that, those things um, shed DNA into the water and into the sediment. So um, you can imagine that if you're a soft bodied organism like a fish, you're sloughing off scales, um, you're urinating into the water, you know, there's all kinds of DNA signatures, there's gametes, there's things like that in the water column that you can pick up on. So you take a water sample, you filter it, you, uh, then you have a, a genetics person um, basically screen it uh, using PCR. And you can set up primers and things like that that are specific for the species you're interested in. You can do meta barcoding. There's lots of different ways you can do identification of species. Um, it's a little bit, when I first started doing this, I thought it was mostly black magic. Um, I was, had very low confidence. But if you look at this graph here um, that's being pictured, we, we took green crabs of, at different um, sort of different types of green crabs. So same species, but we took like um, males and females. Uh, we took ovigerous females, so the egg bearing ones, and we took ones that were hatching as well. And we, we put them all into aquarium tanks and we took water and sediment samples uh, from each one of these treatments. And we had a control and we had one tank where we had like crabs fighting. So they would potentially like exude pheromones into the water. Um, but what you'll notice is the two highest signatures of DNA were those from the egg bearing female and the egg bearing female that was hatching. So um, we kind of came to the initial conclusion that if you want to monitor green crabs using eDNA, um, it's not so easy to do, uh, number one. And number two, it really depends on which life stage you wanna focus on, right? So if you wanna find um, where ovigerous females are, you might have a better time of identifying those hotspots 
than you would um, just identifying plain old hard shelled um, green, cra uh, green crabs that don't have eggs. So that was a big surprise to us and that led us down this whole rabbit hole about why don't we pick up DNA in green crabs unless they have eggs. Um, there's been subsequent work on that. It's complicated. Uh, I would, if it's something that um, you're, you're interested in, I'm happy to talk to you more about it, but um, it is, it's a, it was a very interesting study. And we came to the conclusion that it may not be something we do on a regular basis, but it certainly has its merits um, because you don't have to go trapping. You don't have to do all this, you know, boots on the ground work. You could go out, get a, a grab sample, take that back, store them in a freezer, and then filter a whole bunch of samples and still get some kind of picture of what's happening in your estuary. So really, it's a, it's a really interesting new field, um, at least for us in terms of estuarine monitoring. Um, okay, and so this next telemetry study that we're doing now is gonna be similar to the one that I just described, but we're doing, first of all, we're adding way more receivers in our system. So all those like circles that you see on in our estuary there, those are all receivers. We're creating a, um, a fine scale um, positioning network, which will allow us to not only measure and look at fine scale movements of green crabs, but we'll also be able to look at a home range. So where do they go uh, short term? Uh, what about their short term movements? And what about their big movements? And so we also tag a whole bunch of um, egg bearing females like the one in that picture, right? Crabs carry their eggs in a spongy mass under their abdomen. Um, what blew me away was that they carry their eggs for up to 90 days. Uh, if I'm wrong on that, please tell me, but that's what I've been reading. And uh, I was, couldn't believe it because I thought for sure that the egg development period would be a lot shorter than that. Um, I think it can be shorter than that, but uh, it's not typically uh, very short. So we're gonna be looking at where these eggers go uh, in our estuary with the idea that um, if we wanted to mitigate and pull out eggers at certain times of the year and fish for them, we might, that also might be an option that uh, harvesters can, can do and maybe sell that product as well. So there's all kinds of options out there that we're exploring. Okay, um, one of the biggest hangups to developing a soft shelled product for green crabs is figuring out when they molt. Um, I mean, you know when they molt because you can fish them in traps and catch soft shelled crabs. But if you want to um, hold them and if you want to hold pre molt green crabs and then, and then let them molt so you can sell them right away, um, much bigger problem. And never thought that would be such a big problem. But there's another group that was working on this. And uh, they had the same issue. And so what we're doing is we're setting up these condo trays. You see the, the picture, um, there's like 30 little squares there. And they're a, that whole condo tray is a floating array off of, off of our dock. We put pre-molt crabs in there. Um, we're measuring their blood. We're trying to stage them. We're doing all kinds of things so we can determine um, if there's an easy way to assay a pre-molt green crab so that when they molt, they can be removed immediately and sold. Um, very difficult to do and totally frustrating because um, I'm a lobster biologist, so I'm used to staging lot pre-molt lobsters, which is really easy to do. Um, I could teach you in five minutes how to do it. I would not be able to teach you how to do this in five minutes. Um, this is so far taken most of the summer and uh, it's really challenging. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the nuances of it right now, but um, if any of you have any um, knowledge about this that you wanna share, that'd be great. Um, but we are learning a lot and we have got, we do have crabs that are molting. Um, the males tend to molt sooner and then the followed by the females is, is sort of what we've been seeing so far. Um, so this is another, part of this green crab project that we're doing is sort of identifying uh, characteristics of pre-molt green crabs that we can kind of hone in on that. Um, 
And it, this project that I'm, these, these things that I'm telling you about would not be complete unless we were able to work successfully with end users. Um, we're really big on working with end users. And in this case, what I mean by an end user is I'm talking about commercial and recreational harvesters. So people who are out there um, fishing for green crabs, we have a few people in Wells Harbor who are green crab harvesters. Um, and they're really interested in doing this. And so we're working with them and trying to train them. They're going out fishing with us. Um, they're learning how to draw blood from a crab and measure all kinds of stuff. They're working in the lab with us. But we also wanna be working with uh, continued culinary um, sector on ways that uh, green crab can be used, not just for a culinary use, but for bait as well. We, there's a group uh, colleagues of mine that are using green crabs as um, an alternative bait for horseshoe crabs um, as opposed to whelk. So in the commercial fishery in places like Delaware Bay. So um, there's a lot of really interesting angles here. And I think that's sort of the, the positive note here instead of looking at um, green crabs as horrific, awful things that we can't do anything about. Um, we can find creative ways to use them uh, and apply their apply them to other needs that we have. So I think that's a pretty exciting thing. That's not so much a biological thing, it's more of an entrepreneurial thing. Um, a couple more things I just want to touch on that we're working on. Um, we'll see if this video plays. Um, this is a video of a green crab spawning and we would love to be able to capture this through our telemetry. We're actually developing a tag that sits on the back of a crab that um, when the crab starts hatching, her abdomen starts flapping very profusely and the tag would send a different frequency to our receiver. So we would actually know where crabs are hatching. And that's something we wanna know for um, oceanographic modeling so we can determine where uh, larvae may be affected to. So that's like a pie in the sky project, but it's something that's I think is really cool. But what we do have is um, we do monthly um, plankton toes, and we also just started using these collectors. These um, I used to work in the Florida Keys. Uh, it's where I did all my master's research on spiny lobster, uh, Caribbean spiny lobster. And we used to float these collectors at the surface it's a hog's hair air conditioning filter. And you'll get larvae, lobster larvae will swim inshore and they'll mistake in that for um, algae, which is their preferred settlement habitat. But now what we're doing is we're trapping um, uh, larval crab, lar crab larvae. So we have a bunch of these set um, throughout our estuary and we're looking at spatial dynamics of where those larvae settle. And I don't really have any data yet, except we do have larvae that are settling on there, which is pretty cool. Um, and so here's a picture of some larvae we took under a scope. These are green crab larvae. Um, it took us like, I don't know, months to figure out the difference between green crab larvae, uh, like stage one zoea and um, uh, other crustaceans, like for example, uh, cancer, right? Uh, cancer borealis, Jonah crab, rock crab, hemigrapsis, we get all of those. And um, we've also been getting blue crab larvae as well, which is another thing that's been really dramatically different in our samples. So we've been pulling larvae out and we've been looking at peaks of hatching. And this is one of my favorite plots um, that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, if you look at the, this, the number of megalopi, the megalopa is the, like the final larval stage of most crab species. And um, if you look on the x-axis, you've got month and the y-axis is the number of larvae. And the, the peaks are, the colored peaks are um, coordinated for each species that we typically monitor. So carcinus is the one in pink. Uh, it should be in green, but it's in pink. Um, and the pink, the, the Carcinus peaks, we currently have uh, four peaks of megalope in our estuary, which to me was really astonishing. 
especially because we see ovigerous crabs in our estuary even in February. Uh, yeah, we go out sampling in Maine in February. It's brutal, but um, we really wanted the data. So uh, we see these multiple peaks of settlement, which is really alarming and also really impressive. And so we're trying to learn more about the connection between uh, larval hatching and larval settlement. And then we're using these other tools like telemetry to try to tell us where these crabs go. So it's kind of an interesting story, but we still have a bunch of um, pieces of the puzzle that we need to put together to make that sort of work. Um, I kind of want to, I want to finish up because I want to make sure I have time to, to field questions from some of you. Um, but the one thing that I always ask myself is, um, is this like an ordinary thing, like what we're experiencing? Like, you know, I get people that ask me, isn't this just a cycle? Like green crabs have cycled before in the 1950s, for example, in um, Northern Massachusetts on Cape Ann, there were gajillions of green crabs. Um, they had outbreaks all over the place. And uh, there's a picture here from the uh, clam commissioner in the town of Essex, Massachusetts. And, you know, the, these crabs were everywhere and there was a huge clam shortage. And um, there wasn't, you know, were there climate change issues? Maybe, probably something going on in the background, but nothing like what's going on now. And so I, I always play devil's advocate a little bit and say, if you're taking this many green crabs away, if you're mitigating this in the 1950s, uh, what was different back then that's different now? Or what was the same then that there is now? So uh, it was a very different time. So I, I think it's worth pondering a little bit um, about those, co those time comparisons between um, different decades because green crabs do have a tendency to cycle. Um, however, my argument is there's not a lot of predation. There's not a lot left in the Gulf of Maine, at least in our area, to act as a natural predator. So um, I want to just end by telling you about um, something that we've discovered in the last two years. Um, <clears throat> if people had their voices on, I'd say, what is that? Okay, it's a blue crab. That's not a green crab. Um, it's Kalanecti sapidus. We rarely, there's never been a recorded case of one in our estuary until two years ago. So we've been monitoring green crabs since. Um, we catch a lot of them now pretty regularly. Some of them are really big. And so um, I always ask, are these guys on vacation in Maine or are they essentially, you know, short-term visitors uh, or are they here to stay, right? So it's, it's one of those unanswered questions that we have, but it also makes me think, um, wow, like imagine what their impact could be for better or for worse. Um, I think there's pros and cons for those. So um, something kind of exciting, a little alarming, very interesting from a, a science point of view. Um, but that's what I have. And I, I want to stop here and I could keep talking, but I, I'm going to stop here and just let you know, there's a picture of the web hand at um, Wells Harbor at low tide um, that we typically have 11 to 12 foot tide. So that's, that's a, what we call a drainer where uh, most of our water has left the estuary. Um, feel free to contact me. I left my email there and our website. Um, feel free to visit our reserve anytime. And um, we'd love to see you in Maine. And I hope that I can get down there at some point. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Sam. And um, if there's questions, I'm happy to keep talking. Sure, well, we also hope that we can get you down here as well. Um, we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I will read them um, and we will mark them answered as we go. So the first question from an anonymous attendee, um, if I'm misinterpreting this, you know, whoever it is, you can write back in, but um, they wrote, when do they have soft shells for eating? Uh, what, when do they, uh, when do they? Yeah, know? I'm wondering if it, maybe it was, it was when you were touching on um, that you really 
couldn't determine their molting and the, and the the cyclical nature of that. But I, I guess they're wondering if there's like a, a harvest season or or anything like that. That's what would be my interpretation. Yeah. So there, you know, I go back to my lobster reference for a minute. You know, in, for lobsters, uh, lobstermen know when soft shell lobsters are going to show up. They go out, they target them and they get a different dock price for them. Uh, it's the same thing for blue crabs in the mid-Atlantic, right? In Maryland and Virginia, they, they have different market prices for, for, those, for those seasons. We don't really have, I mean, I think we have a season for soft shell green crab. We're just trying to figure out, we're trying to hone in on that. And if we can hone in on that, then we can make it, we can train harvesters on where to go and how to fish them or how to hold them, get them to molt, and then sell them. Um, that's what the Venetians do in Italy, and they're very successful at it. Um, and short of going to Italy to go figure it out myself, um, we're still going to keep fighting and, and figuring it out here first. Um, we have noticed uh, a peak in molting with males that happened recently. And now we're just starting to see female molting in our area. But I imagine it would be very different in different areas. And I think it's, it's gonna be linked to water temperature, um, but it could be linked to other things too. So I hope that may have answered the anonymous person's question. Sure, yeah. And if, if not, whoever, you can write back in if you need clarification. Yeah. Um, the next is from Jack, actually. He said, not a question, but I would connect with RJ from the Nantucket Land Council. They are also working with green crab condos. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, please send me his information if you don't mind. I'd love to connect with sure. him. Sure, we can make Thank that you. happen. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question, are green crabs still increasing in Maine or are they approaching their carrying capacity? Really awesome question. Um, it, it depends who you ask. Um, we're gonna have a lot more. So one of the other monitoring projects we do, we call the Green Crab 100. So for the last two years we go out, um, we have a few random, randomly selected spots. We pull crabs and we look at density, catch per unit effort, size structure, all that stuff. Um, it seems to be pretty stable uh, and that, but I'm only speaking about our one estuary. Um, over the last decade or so, it, it does appear that green crabs have really exploded. Um, we, we, we have a lot of issues with green crabs and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. So I, I think it's probably not, not something that would diminish. But that being said, when you look at the, the cyclical cycle of some of these species, um, they do have their booms, boom and bust periods. And so um, I don't know what carrying capacity is for these guys. That's a really great question. It seems like it's unlimited, but I know that's impossible. So um, I'm not sure. We have another question from Jack. Um, ever thought about making an air conditioner filter trap for green crab larval sediment that somehow excludes other crab species? Yeah, we, I'd love to do that, Jack. Um, sounds like we should talk at some point, but um, we're experimenting with these surface collectors first um, because I'm familiar with them and we have the material, so it was more of an opportunistic thing. Um, we're also, we also have some subsurface ones that we're trying. Uh, they were designed for blue crab megalope in places like the, in the Gulf Coast. Um, and we actually haven't pulled them yet uh, because we, are, we can't get our boat in the water, another story. So once we get the boat back in the water, we're gonna go pull those and see what we get. But it would be really interesting if we had something that was specific for green crabs. Um, I'm not sure how you would exclude other crab larvae uh, because so many other crab larvae have similar behaviors. Uh, so it would be really tough to, to do that. All right, our next question is from Val. Um, she's wondering, have you done any studies matching the plankton in the water column during the times the crab larvae are in the water? 
to see if there is a match or mismatch between larval release and food availability. Um, and then she's mentioned, uh, we are concerned with that issue regarding the effect of seawater warming on the timing of the release of bay scallop larvae in Nantucket Harbor. Any suggestions of how to study this? So it's a two part question there. Oh yeah, that's, that's heavy. Um, so we are, the first part of your question is we are doing what, what I think we're doing what you're suggesting, which is we're pairing our plankton toes with our presumed um, ability to see when green crabs are hatching. So to go one step further, we've tagged, right? We've put telemetry tags on green crabs. Some of the green crabs are fitted with these special tags that will um, ping a different frequency when, the, when they're hatching, we think, but we're ground truthing it in the laboratory. So in our lab, we're, we're holding green crabs at the same temperature that the estuary is at, at the same egg stages. So we're able to kind of see what's observationally what's going on in the lab, pair that with the field, and then, then also pair that with our plankton toes. So I think that's, that's sort of our way to connect the dots um, for that. With I don't know much about scallops, unfortunately, um, but if you want to look for a match mismatch, um, I mean, I don't know if people have played around with manipulating temperature, I would imagine warmer temperatures, they would hatch sooner, but I'm not positive about that. And I don't even know, I, I guess they eat like phytoplankton or something, um, scallop larvae, but I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Our next question, do you find green crabs with white legs? We have found a few here and are curious what causes it. Absolutely. Um, we have we we also keep track of the ventral color of the crab. So, um, wh whoever asked that question, you sh I'm sure you notice that the bottom of the crab is also sometimes very different colors. It can be orange, red. Um, it can be green. It can be like different shades of green. Um, there's various reasons for that. Um, I am not convinced on any one reason. Um, some people think it's genetics diet, um, uh, reproductive stage, maturity level, things like that. Um, I'm not really sure. There, there's nothing's been steadfastly shown that would convince me. Um, but the white, I think sometimes they get these calcified deposits in their legs. And, that, and sometimes I've also seen it at the, um, on the tips of the claws and at the base um, uh, at, at the like the ventral ventral flap of the abdomen as well, I've seen um, sort of like whitish specks or like a concentration of white color. So I think it's a, a calcification thing, and I, you see it in lobsters, and you see it in Jonah crab all the time. Interesting. Um, our next question from Jack again: What have you found is the most effective bait for green crab when trapping? Um, anything. <laughs> I mean, we use salted herring. It's what's used in the lobster fishery and we have access to it. So that's what we use. Um, I've heard people using like ch chicken feet, hot dogs, um, any kind of fish, like scrap fish fillets, anything should catch them. What we try to do is we try to use the same bait all the time and the same amount. So that, because we're, we're interested in um, calculating catch per unit effort. And so in order to do that, you really, you, 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 don't, you don't wanna bias a trap that you have like hot dogs in and a trap that you have like delicious, like salted herring. So we try to like keep things consistent. All right, our next question. Anyone thinking about using eDNA to hunt egg bearing females for caviar? Okay, so I have heard that the caviar from green crabs is tastes awful. I have not tried <laughs> it. <laughs> you can try it. Um, I don't plan on trying it. Um, I don't not much, I don't eat that much seafood. So um, I, um, but I think it'd be really interesting to use eDNA, e like I mentioned, to track 
um, egg bearing crabs as you know, if you could try to hone in on where they are, it, there, there's some evidence that we have, it's very loose that egg bearing crabs will go to a particular area of the estuary or the bay to do their hatching. Um, blue crabs do this all the time. They, it's very well documented. They, the females will travel down the estuary. Um, the, the females will travel down to the mouth of the estuary. They'll release their larvae. The larvae um, are vected into the open ocean. And then those developing larvae, when they're mature larvae or megalope, they will move back up into the estuary. It's really amazing. Um, they will use the tides, they will ride the tides back up into the estuary. So if you look at a big, really big estuary like Chesapeake Bay, that's exactly what they do. Um, we don't know if green crabs do a similar thing, but we'd really like to know because that will inform us about um, the dispersal and the um, trajectories that green crab larvae might take depending on where they're hatching. So it's it's sort of for us like a little holy grail, we would really like to find where that happens. So that's a great question. All right, our next question is from Georgia. Um, can you explain the telemetry system more? How does it work? How many crabs do you usually monitor with that at once? And how long did the tags last? And are the tags held on with duct tape? <laughs> okay, rule number one in being a marine biologist, Duct tape and crazy glue and cable ties, you can do just about anything. So um, make sure that you take note of that because you can go very far in life with those three things. Um, I have. <laughs> so the telemetry system doesn't involve any of those things. Um, it's a very expensive system and we're um, re really lucky that we have a grant to help fund a lot of that work. Uh, so essentially the um, you have the tags, okay? So each, in this case, the tags are individually coded. So they ping at a certain frequency that gets picked up by these receivers. So it's sort of like, um, imagine if you have like an easy pass for your car and you go through a toll plaza or you go through a high speed lane toll plaza, right? That easy pass, your transponder, right? Is getting recorded. So it knows when you passed, uh, what your vehicle is, what time, what the date was. That's exactly how these tags work. So um, they're fastened to the crab. Um, we use uh, like an epoxy duct tape thing with a um, like this plastic filament that goes around their shell. It's really hard to put on because the shells are not great for it. And we we did a lot of practice and kept them in the lab to make sure the tag stayed on. Um, and yes, they will lose the tag when they molt. So you have to be careful about when you put the tags on. So you get the longest period of tracking. Um, these tags are designed to, the battery life on the tag is designed um, in this particular sense for about six months. Um, they make tags that'll go a year. You can get tags that go on and then go off and then go on again. So you can save battery. Um, there's all kinds of ways you can do it, depending on what question you want to answer. Um, in terms of the, how the array is set up, it's basically these receivers, which look like bombs, essentially. They're these black cylinders about this big. Um, they're round. And I'm sorry, I didn't have a picture of one in my slides. Um, and you fasten them to a mooring or a trap or something. And again, the crab goes near it, and it, it pings, and it records it. And you download all this stuff. And then you have to do a lot of statistics and a lot of analyses to determine false detections and real detections. And you basically get a picture though of the fine scale movements of those crabs. Um, it's really, really cool. It's really um, expensive and really hard to analyze the data, but it gives you the best um, resolution, uh, fine scale resolution more so than just, you know, putting a, you know, a cable tie on their claw or something like that. All right. I hope that answered most of your questions related to that. Uh, it sounds very thorough. I think I think we got it. Um, the last question, I think you actually just answered with that same question because the question was about how long do the telemetry tags last? Mm -hmm. And 
uh, this was Jack. He said, I imagine they come off when the crabs molt. So I think he they just do. covered that. Yeah. They do. And and I used I did a lot for some of my PhD research, I did a uh, lobster tagging study. Um, and that was awesome because if you, I was tagging um, egg bearing females and they have a, an egg development of almost a year. So nine to 11 months. So if you stick the tag on at the beginning of egg development, you're gonna get, they're not gonna molt. Uh, they're not gonna molt and lose their eggs. So you get like almost a year's worth of data out of these things, which is awesome. Um, green crabs, more challenging, but then again, we're really just, really our window of opportunity that we're interested in is uh, spring, you know, spring into late fall. So we will have to pull all the receivers out by November because then we'll get ice and we won't, we won't, we'll start losing stuff. So we, we really can't do winter tracking. That makes sense. All right, well, that was the end of all of our questions. Um, thank you so much for uh, presenting. Uh, it was you know, so great. I loved all the pictures that you included. Um, really, really thorough. Um, to everyone else that's out there, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, just a note that, of course, our Science Speaker Series is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. throughout the summer, so you can join us next week, same time, same place on Zoom. Um, and another thank you to our sponsors, Bank of America, Cape Air, The White Elephant, and Cisco Brewers. And um, they, again, thank you, Dr. Goldstein, for presenting and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have a great summer, everybody. Thank you. You Take too. Take care.